Hello and welcome to Freed Indeed Live. I'm your host, Kevin J.N. Hughes, and I am here for what I think is going to be actually one of our really... Uh, I'm really excited for this episode. Um, this is a question that we've actually received at the ministry, and it's a question that I myself had. So basically... Um, that's a question of how does someone become a canonized saint in the Orthodox Church? And I'm really interested to see kind of, you know, everyone knows how someone becomes a saint in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, that there's kind of this very formal process. You have to have two confirmed miracles, and then those get submitted to this rigorous sort of scientific testing um, because the Western mind has become a complete slave to physical sciences. Um, but a lot of people don't know that that process, that very formal process, was actually itself something that was first established in 1234 AD. So 1200 years after the apostles is when that originates. It is not an ancient practice. And in orthodoxy, we have a very different system, a very different mindset, uh, which actually dates back to the earliest days of the church. So I want to talk about that today, and hopefully you guys will find this interesting. Uh, if you're not Orthodox, hopefully this will be interesting just from sort of a human um, human interest kind of perspective. If you are Orthodox, hopefully this helps to kind of clarify our own practices and, and maybe strengthens your understanding of our own practices. But first, before we get into that, our if you want to support what we're doing, if you find what we're doing beneficial to you and you want to help us out, uh, the best way to support our work is through Patreon. Um, and there's a link in the description below where you can access Patreon and become a member today. You get access to certain member-exclusive perks. And... Um, for as little as $1 a month, which is practically nothing, you'll be making a huge difference in enabling the work that Freed Indeed Ministries is doing. So please, if you're in a financial position to do so, do consider helping us out. And also support our sponsors like Queen of Peace Bookstore, um, God the Father Apparel, Lift Life, and raise energy, support um, those companies, support the uh, support them, and in doing so, you'll be supporting us. So I appreciate that. Now, let's get into today's topic. So first of all, what is a saint? Well, the word saint comes from sanctus, which means holy. And so a saint is literally a holy one. So in that sense, God is the only true saint, the only true holy one. He alone is truly holy. And the saints are like icons of God, people who have become holy through the work of God in their lives become like icons of God. So angels are actually called holy ones. Uh, for example, we talk about Saint Michael and Saint Gabriel. These are beings who were created holy and have retained that original holiness. So um, people can also become holy through a relationship with God. And in that sense, uh, as, you know, the New Testament addresses Christians as saints. So all Christians are saints in this sort of broad sense. 
But Hebrews 12, 1 also speaks of the saints who have gone on before us as a great cloud of witnesses. So you have that idea as well, this idea of saints um, who are um, a great cloud of witnesses, the saints who've gone before us. The Orthodox Church of America on their website has this definition offered. It says, the word saint means holy, thus Saint John means holy John. This is not to say that he was always perfect, or that he was a genius, or that he was great according to the understanding of this world, or that his views on politics, social life, or economics were always desirable or correct. What it means is that within the context of his age and his life, he manifested the image of God in himself in some way, and that he was like an icon an original creation, a new creature in Christ. So that's what saints are. They're, for maybe the best way to understand the saints is as icons. So with that in mind, let's talk about the purpose of why the Orthodox Church sees fit to recognize certain people as saints. If all true Christians are in fact saints, and all of our goal is to become saints with a capital S, to become icons of Christ, then, you know, why do we, why do we actually canonize certain people? And the purpose behind that is several fold. First of all, the saints inspire us to holy lives of our own. They inspire us to live lives that are holy. Their stories are inspirational for us and make us better people. So by understanding and listening to the lives of the saints, by kind of hearing the lives of the saints, exploring the lives of the saints, meditating on the lives of the saints, we are meditating on icons of Christ, and that is worthy of imitation. As St. Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me, therefore, as I imitate Christ. Christ. So having these stories of the lives of the saints enables us to do that. We imitate their holy lives in that they imitated Christ. We also uh, see that another reason to recognize saints is because they can pray for us. As St. James writes in James 5.16, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, it says, I urge you to pray for all people. Nowhere does it say that this stops happening when a person passes from this life to the next in the hope of glory. We have no reason to think that we can't pray for people once we die. So, um, it seems very obvious that those who prayed for us in life continue praying for us. Because in Orthodoxy, we believe in the resurrection. We don't believe that death separates us from the love of Christ. Therefore, we don't have a problem with that. I'll answer a quick objection here. Some people... Um, when you explain this, they might bring up 1 Timothy 2.5. Um, I've already addressed and talked about um, the Protestant understanding of 1 Timothy 2.5 multiple times on the show, but that's fine. We will go ahead and do it again because I think it's valuable to explain this a little bit. So 1 Timothy 2. We'll actually start in verse 1, 
because a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. So we're going to start in verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all people. So right off the bat, St. Paul begins this um, second, this, well, he begins this thought with urging us to pray and intercede on behalf of others. So when we get down to verse 5 and people want to say that saying Jesus is the one mediator means Jesus is the only one who can pray for us, that's a problem because St. Paul has just said that has just commended the act of praying for other people. But we go on. Uh, so first of all, I urge that requests, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all people, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of our God and Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, even the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. For this was appointed, for this I was appointed as a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying as a teacher of the Gentiles and of faith and truth. Sorry, in faith and truth. So we have one, the Orthodox Church very firmly believes that we have one mediator between God and man, as St. Job spoke about. He says that he longed that there would be someone to put his hand on both you, meaning God, and me, meaning man. So that is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one mediator, the one go-between, the one. What a mediator is, is one who reconciles two parties. Jesus is the only one who reconciles two parties, namely reconciles God to man and man to God. He is the God-man who brings together God and man. Okay, so that is, that's what being the one mediator means. In this context, being a mediator has nothing to do with prayer, because St. Paul has just urged us all so a mediator and an intercessor are not the same thing. St. Paul has just urged all Christians everywhere to be intercessors. So he's obviously not in verse 5 saying that there's one intercessor between God and man, because then what he just said would be negated. He's clearly saying that there's one mediator, there's only one Savior, Mary, the saints, as glorious as they may be, our guardian angels, as wonderful as they may be, none of them are saviors. Only Jesus is the savior. Only Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. However, once we've been saved, we are called to intercede for others. And again, nothing indicates that this stops when we pass from this life to the next in the hope of glory, and nothing indicates that it should. And certainly the church has never believed that, that we uh, cease interceding. So at the end of the day, the point here is that context is king, and a, a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. So if you're saying that 1 Timothy 2.5 means that we shouldn't pray for other people or that other people shouldn't pray for us, that's an invalid reading since 1 Timothy 1 through 4 literally admonishes Christians to pray for one another. So um, 
And I would even note, actually, that we did a video responding to Daniel Mesa about the Holy Spirit. And in that video, we saw Daniel Mesa's comments were saying that the Holy Spirit must not be a real entity because you have, or I guess that's not exactly what he was saying, but he was saying that the Holy Spirit must be the quote-unquote spirit of Christ and therefore not distinct from Christ because Jesus is the only mediator and it also says that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us so therefore they can't be different because otherwise something something anyway it doesn't matter the point is you could accuse me of reducing protestantism's take on first timothy 2 5 to the absurd but unfortunately i'm not this is a real um seventh day adventist minister taking the standard Protestant interpretation of 1 Timothy 2.5 to a logical conclusion, which leads him to denying that the, Holy, that the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us because he can't have that since, you know, we have one mediator and it's nonsense. But context is king. That verse isn't about prayer. It's about being the mediator of salvation through whom we have access to God. And that access is something we ought to use to pray for others. Getting back on track, we've seen that so far the reasons why we recognize saints is because we imitate them as they imitate Christ, and so their stories can inspire us to good works. And we've seen that they can pray for us, because all Christians pray for one another, whether they're in the church triumphant or the church um, militant. But moving forward, we also recognize that one of the reasons for having pa having saints is so that Christians can have patron saints. So in ancient Rome, there was a concept called a patron. And basically what a patron was is you would have sort of your patron would be if you wanted to advance in Roman society, if you wanted to become maybe a senator or something, you would have what's called a patron. And uh, this idea of a patron is someone who kind of come someone who has already attained what you're trying to attain. And so now they kind of coached you and helped you and built you up and got you into sort of, you might say, introduced you to the right people, helped you with your cause, helped you with your things. So that's what a patron was. And we still talk about, we still use that term to this very day. For example, someone who is very wealthy and donates lots of money to a young artist is called their patron or a patron of the arts or of that artist in particular in some cases. So someone who very passionate, who, who's very passionate about art might help a aspiring artist to become um, to become more connected. And in doing so, they become a patron of that artist. Okay, so that's kind of that's what we're talking about here is a patron in that sense. And where do we see this in the Bible? Well, we see it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29. 
So lots of people have had various opinions about that, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and read from Religion of the Apostles by Father Stephen de Young, and we'll see this is on page 141. So go ahead and get this book and read the whole context of what I'm talking about, and hopefully you'll get a good idea of what it is. There's more that could be said. There's more that probably should be said. But I'm going to read this and and we'll go from there. So one example that St. Paul gives in particular <clears throat> Excuse me. One example that St. Paul gives in particular has been the subject of much speculation throughout history. In 1 Corinthians 15.29, he refers to those who are baptized for the dead. If the dead are not raised to life, then this practice makes no sense. The exact practice St. Paul was referring to, however, has not one single unified history of interpretation. You know, there's like Mormons who say one thing, there's all kinds of crazy speculative theories, but we actually know what he's talking about. There are very few comments from early Christian sources on the text, and those that do exist do not always agree with each other, but a close reading of the text gives an idea of what this practice was. It is in fact a practice that still occurs today within the Orthodox Church, and ironically was practiced even by the patristic commentators who did not make this particular connection. So, you know, remember that in Orthodoxy, the whole reason why, like the whole reason why I converted to Orthodoxy, for example, is because we preserve the tradition of the apostles. That's the goal of orthodoxy, and that's what's happening here. We're preserving the tradition of the apostles, of baptizing people for the dead. And what does that mean? In 1 Corinthians, St. Paul inquires, otherwise what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are they baptized for them? First. 1529, many modern understandings of this verse are shaped by more ambiguous English translations rather than careful analysis of the original language, nor do many of these modern interpretations take into account the overall context of St. Paul's discussion in this chapter and therefore in 1 Corinthians in general. St. Paul refers to those who are baptized for the dead, meaning he is referring to a particular group. There are some who are baptized for the dead and others who are baptized but not for the dead. It is important to notice that the word baptized is passive in both uses in this verse. It is not those who are baptized for the dead, but those who are baptized. Baptized for it is not those who baptize for the dead, excuse me, but those who are baptized for the dead. The action here being described is something that is done by those who are being baptized, not by the baptizer. So the fact that St. Paul refers to those who does not mean that it is some other sect outside of what would be recognized as Christianity. This verse is not speaking of people who perform some type of baptism other than Christian baptism, but rather of a group of people who receive Christian baptism in a certain way. Baptism, for St. Paul, is not merely an action that conveys certain benefits on an individual who receives it. Rather, baptism creates a series of relationships in which the recipient is brought by that action. So, for example, the Apostle can speak of those who passed through the Red Sea as having been baptized into Moses in 1 Corinthians 10.2. Being baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, the Holy Spirit and water brought them into relationship with Yahweh, the God of Israel, and that relationship was mediated through Moses and through the covenant that was given through him. Likewise, St. Paul speaks of those who have received Christian baptism as those who have been baptized into Christ and have put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. Elsewhere in the New Testament, the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin is referred to as the baptism of John. 
for the same reason. In the um, so then he goes on to talk about Mormonism and explains why Mormonism is wrong. But I'm going to skip on a little bit. And in page 143, he says, The key to understanding the identity of the dead in the first half of 1529 is obscured by the English translation. Even though it is translated both halves of the verse as the dead, St. Paul actually uses the Greek article only in the first case. This is common for St. Paul when he is speaking about all deceased persons in the world. He does not use the definite article, he is referring to dead people in general. This is the case in the second half of the verse, if the dead are not raised at all. But when he uses the Greek article, which would most correctly be translated these dead, he is nearly always referring to deceased Christians in particular. Hence, the article separates these dead Christians from the dead in general. If the people whom Saint Paul to whom St. Paul refers are being baptized for dead Christians, so because he said in so just to kind of clarify that, what Stephen de Young is pointing out is that St. Paul first he he doesn't actually say those who are baptized for the dead, he says those who are baptized for these dead, meaning for Christians who have died. <clears throat> Um, so, if the people whom Saint, to whom St. Paul refers are being baptized for these dead Christians, who would themselves already have received Christian baptism during their lives, so it's not anything like Mormonism, then our understanding of being baptized for them must change. The Greek preposition here is uper, which is the source of the English excuse me, of the English prefix hyper, related to super in Latin. So um, I'm going to skip on a little bit again. The use of these dead would most naturally refer back to the previous mentioned in verse 6, where Paul is speaking of people who, when they were baptized, were being baptized in the name of one of these departed saints. So putting this together with St. Paul's general understanding of baptism, we can see how someone taking the name of a departed saint at their baptism would create a relationship between the person being baptized and the saint. This relationship can best be described with the Roman understanding of patronage that I already explained. So definitely read this book and um, if you haven't read this book, at least just check out that section of this book where he talks about baptism for the dead. Again, it's page 141 through 145. So I'm going to stop reading that for right now, though, because um, this is, you know, Stephen D. Young isn't here to explain it to us. But the point is that. Um, for example, when I was baptized, when I was actually chrismated in the Orthodox Church, I received the name Nicholas. And so I have been united to St. Nicholas, the Passion Bearer, and, um, and he is my patron saint. So this is part of Orthodox mysticism, is that we create these unions between ourselves and our patron saint for the purpose of that patron saint who has already attained what we are seeking to attain to be able to help us along in the way. And I, for one, will take all the help I can get. So, um, so the point of the, 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 kind of the point I'm getting at is that recognizing saints, if nothing else, it helps us to have a communion between the whole body of Christ, the body of Christ here on earth, and the body of Christ in glory. So how does this happen? Well, we've seen what we don't do, um, the 1234 AD method of canonizing saints, and we've also seen 
why recognition of saints is important. So now it's time to examine what exactly, how exactly a person becomes a saint. I'm going to throw in a quick disclaimer, though. And that disclaimer is that on All Saints Day in the Orthodox Church, we recognize all of those who are known only to God. The implication being that there are many people who are saints, who the church, for whatever reason, um, has not canonized. And that's because all true Christians are striving to be saints. All true Christians who love Jesus are saints. And there are multitudes of saints who have never been canonized and couldn't be. We all strive to become saints. This video is really just talking about how the church recognizes certain individuals as saints and how, you know, how that happens. It's not to say that people who aren't canonized therefore aren't saints, which makes a lot of sense because as we're about to see, the church doesn't make saints, we recognize them. So here is a quote from the class classroom synon, classroom synonym, which is an Orthodox um, catechesis basically program. So this quote says, "There is no formal canonization process in the Orthodox Church." <gasps> No formal process, process, process. There is no formal canonization process in the Orthodox Church. This is because it is firmly believed that God creates saints, not the Church. A person who is recognized as holy receives prayers from people who ask the saint to intervene for them in heaven. In this case, the saints are considered specialists in prayer who can help people's prayers be heard. At some point, the saint's name will be listed among the choir of saints on their feast day, and a liturgical cycle will be performed in their honor, at which point they will be considered canonized. There is an informal process whereby the bishop may review the saint's history, but this is not required. So, the two words that OCA.org uses are informal and organic. Canonization, quote, does not make anyone a saint. It only recognizes that they already were, end quote. So this process is informal and organic, not like the uh, formal, lengthy, and frankly, scientific process employed by the Roman Catholic Church since 1234 AD. Um, a quick note on the word canonization. Something is canonized when it becomes part of the liturgy. So, for example, we talk about the canon of scripture, and that's literally the books that are read in church. In, through the liturgical cycle, which is why some churches have a different canon than other churches. Um, for example, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church reads from uh, lots of different books that are not found in any other canon. That's not because the rest of the, for example, the Book of Enoch is very revered by all Orthodox Christians, and yet most of us don't include it in our canon. Um, that's because the Book of Enoch isn't read in church in most Orthodox churches. So, so with that understanding, canonized saints are those who are recognized in the liturgy. They're liturgically recognized saints. Um, I would also make a note that since in Orthodoxy we believe that the Divine Liturgy is one of the ways through which God preserves apostolic tradition, that means we see the liturgy as one of the aspects of the faith that is 
uh, what you might call inspired. It's God breathed. It's guided out by God. We do not believe that the liturgy is something that can contain error. Um, so as a result, I will say that um, I know that in the Roman Catholic tradition, there's a debate going on right now about whether or not the whether or not saints, the canonization of saints is infallible. Um, there, in fact, there's a book, Are Canonizations Infallible? So read that book if you want to understand the Roman Catholic perspective. But from an Orthodox perspective, it most definitely the recognition of saints is at least the recognition of orth when the Eastern Orthodox Church recognizes someone as a saint, we do not believe that's something that the church can get wrong. Uh, everyone that the Eastern Orthodox Church recognizes as a saint is one. So I just wanted to make that point, but it's also a very informal process. Most people today are used to and probably more comfortable with the very formal method that's employed by the Roman Catholic Church. But for the first millennium of church history, that simply was not how things were done, and people were recognized as saints informally. The first effort to create a, an official list, an official canon of saints, was begun in 993 AD, so almost 1,000 years after Christ. The Great Schism resulted in two vastly different traditions regarding sainthood. The Roman Catholic tradition, on the one hand, with its very formal, very legal process, versus the Orthodox with its very mystical and united process for recognizing saints. Um, another point that should be made is that the quickest way to sainthood is martyrdom. As noted by Stephen de Young, the early saint, the most early, most of the early saints were martyrs, which is why uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, it talks about people being baptized for the, or um, people being baptized for these dead. Uh, the reason why they were already dead is because they had been martyred. Martyrdom is the quickest way to become a saint, though not always the easiest. However, there are also a lot of the early saints were what was called confessors. For example, St. Mark the Confessor. Um, a confessor is someone who was tortured, for their faith to near death, but survived. So these were essentially seen as living martyrs, it's someone who experienced martyrdom and lived to tell about it. Okay, so the most important takeaway is that in orthodoxy, glorification, or what is called canonization in the West, is something that the where the church is recognizing something that's already true. We don't make someone a saint. God makes them a saint. We only recognize what God has done if it's his will for us to be able to do so. To review, the basic process is that um, if someone is recognized by their local parish or by a few different local parishes as a particularly holy person, then those local parishes will kind of start looking at them as a saint after they've passed away. And then typically what happens is that then they will be there will be a request with the diocese for them to become a saint and special prayers will be said. Sometimes there is an optional procedure in which a bishop will um, convene a 
search committee, basically, to investigate the saint's life. We don't have some process of expecting certain miracles to take place, but, and that search, <clears throat> excuse me, that search committee is by no means a requirement, but I bring it up because, um, Obviously, the church does not want to and can't recognize people as saints who didn't live a holy life. So sometimes, just to make sure there will be an investigation done, just to sort out uh, that this person did in fact live a holy life and confirm what the people are saying. But again, that's not a requirement. Uh, the only requirement really is that um, these is that the people start venerating them as a particularly holy person and that the church recognizes them on the calendar. That's how it is. So um, all I'll say other than that is we should all be striving to be saints. There's no formal process by which someone becomes a saint because it's God who makes saints, not us. And saints are living icons of God in the world. So let's all strive to be living icons of God in the world. Today, St. Nicholas the Passion Bearer, pray for us.